Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. The San Andreas Fault is one of the most infamous fault zones on the planet. It runs right through the heart of California, and you constantly hear about the threat of the big one. But what exactly is the San Andreas Fault? How does it work? Where can you see it? And how worried should you be about the big one if you live in California? We're going to answer all of that and more on today's adventure of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures, where we're going to go see firsthand the San Andreas Fault. So let's go. So the San Andreas Fault is one of the boundaries of the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And the San Andreas Fault is a strike-slip fault, meaning that rather than one side of the fault moving relatively up or down as opposed to the other side, both sides of the fault just slide past one another. So the Pacific Plate moves north-northwest, while the North American Plate moves south-southwest. And where they come together, they grind past each other, forming the San Andreas Fault. And the relative motion of the plates is kind of shown in this diagram here. So geographically speaking, the San Andreas Fault runs for over 700 miles from Bombay Beach in the Salton Sea in Southern California, up through Southern California, kind of east of Los Angeles, um, up into the center of the state, well, the west center of the state at the Coast Range. And then it goes through San Jose, Palo Alto, San Francisco, and kind of follows the coast up north until Cape Mendocino, which is where the Mendocino Triple Junction occurs, which is where the Juan de Fuca Plate, Pacific Plate, and North American Plate come together, and that is where the beginning, the southern end of the Cascadia Subduction Zone starts. So the San Andreas Fault, geographically, is also split into three segments. You have the northern segment, the central segment, and the southern segment. So from north to south, the northern segment runs from Cape Mendocino down to Hollister, which is the scope of this visual in the map. And notable cities in the northern section include San Francisco, San Jose, uh, the entire San Francisco Bay Area, basically. And as you can see from this map, there have been three notable earthquakes on the northern segment of the San Andreas Fault within the last 120 or so years. And they've all been centered around San Francisco. You had the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the 1957 San Francisco earthquake, and the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Now, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake was especially damaging because it was so big. It was a magnitude 7.8, and that's kind of towards the maximum strength of earthquake you can get on the San Andreas Fault, so it was the quote-unquote big one. Um, around 3,000 people died, and three-fourths of the city of San Francisco was left homeless because... That's how many buildings were either collapsed or burned in that earthquake. So it was very devastating. The 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake was a 6.9 in magnitude, and it was damaging, but it wasn't nearly as damaging as the 1906 earthquake. You had some buildings and bridges collapse, um, but not too many casualties. So the area of the San Andreas Fault, uh, especially the northern segment of the San Andreas Fault, is quite active, geologically speaking. The central segment of the San Andreas Fault, which runs from Hollister down to around Parkfield, is a really interesting segment of the San Andreas Fault because it's quiet. Uh, now what I mean by that is it doesn't really produce large earthquakes or any earthquakes because it experiences a phenomenon called aseismic creep, which is basically the fault moves and there is motion along the fault, but it doesn't cause earthquakes. Why? Because it's not locked up. Both sides of the fault just seamlessly slide past one another and don't cause earthquakes. It's like it's lubed up, for lack of a better term. So tectonic plates are always moving, but they get stuck. And as they get stuck, they still want to move, so the stress is building and building, and when that stress reaches a critical point, that's when the fault ruptures and the earthquake occurs. But because this central segment of the San Andreas Fault is not getting locked up, in a way, the tectonic plates are free to move past one another without getting stuck, thus not causing that rupture of energy, which is an earthquake. Which seamlessly leads me to my next point, the southern section of the San Andreas Fault. So geographically speaking, the southern section of the San Andreas Fault runs from Parkfield down to Bombay Beach at the Salton Sea, where the San Andreas Fault ends and the Gulf of California Rift Zone begins. Now, the San Andreas Fault in its totality is dangerous, but the southern section of the San Andreas Fault is the most dangerous segment of the San Andreas Fault. 
Now, why that is, is because it's a mix of really high population in areas like Los Angeles, the Inland Empire, San Diego, Palm Springs, etc., etc. But the other reason is that, geologically speaking, the southern section of the San Andreas Fault is quite hazardous. So, as you can see here, there haven't really been any notable earthquakes in this segment of the San Andreas Fault, other than the Parkfield earthquake, which is at the north section, which occurred in 2004, which is part of an earthquake interval that occurs every 20 to 30 years, and the Fort Tijon earthquake, a magnitude 7.9 in 1857 at that northern section. So this section of the San Andreas Fault has been very quiet, and that is what's alarming. As I was previously alluding to, an earthquake occurs when a fault is stuck and the stress is too great so it ruptures. Now, the southern section of the San Andreas Fault has been stuck for hundreds of years. And because it's been stuck for so long, the amount of energy in the fault is very high. So when that um, energy ruptures in an earthquake, it's going to be a very strong, very powerful earthquake because it's been silent for so long. That's what's alarming about the Cascadia subduction zone in the Pacific Northwest, and this is exactly what's alarming in the southern section of the San Andreas Fault. So you're probably going to have an earthquake in magnitudes of upper sevens or low eights when the big one, quote unquote, occurs in Southern California. Now, different geologic models have produced different probabilities of the, quote, big one striking LA and the Southern San Andreas Fault, but some models suggest 31% likelihood that an earthquake measuring magnitude 7.5 or greater will hit the southern San Andreas, and others suggest that there's a 75% likelihood that an earthquake of magnitude 7.5 or greater strikes the southern San Andreas slash Los Angeles area in the next 30 years. So yeah, that's really alarming. And San Francisco and the Bay Area is no exception to this either, as the San Andreas Fault literally goes under the city of San Francisco, and you've got a slew of faults like the Hayward Fault, the San Gregorio Fault, and uh, the Rogers Creek Fault that parallel the San Andreas Fault and also account for movement between the Pacific and North American plates. So the probability of the San Francisco Bay Area experiencing a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake within the next 30 years is about 62% according to this study. And that's just a part of living in California. California is a very tectonically active region, and that's just the reality of it. So now that we've gotten this long lecture about the San Andreas Fault and all of the earthquake risks associated with it out of the way, let's go into the field and see the fault for ourselves. So if you want to see the San Andreas Fault from Point Reyes, the way to get there from San Francisco is to take US 101 North to exit 450B in San Rafael and then take Sir Francis Drake Boulevard all the way to Point Reyes National Seashore. About an hour. So we're here on the earthquake trail at Point Reyes National Seashore, which is just north of San Francisco. And uh, we're about to see the San Andreas Fault. So the area around me, very beautiful, um, very quaint. You would not think that such a destructive fault line capable of producing a magnitude 8 earthquake runs right underneath us. But it does. So let's go check it out, shall we? Beautiful weather right now. It's uh, kind of raining, but we're also kind of in the sun here uh, in the coastal chaparral scrublands of North Central California, you got a Douglas fir right here, and a uh, bunch of oaks over there. Just more of those scenic views, Douglas firs, Bishop Pines, Redwoods, and of course, California scrub oaks. Yeah, and a gray squirrel right there. So here's a really interesting blurb showcasing geology and how the San Andreas Fault, the boundary between the North American and Pacific plates, shapes it. Part of a 30 million year story that's still unfolding. So 20 million years ago, Point Reyes was right by LA, and the fault moved it all the way up to just north of San Francisco, where it is today. And then 10 million years from now, the plate boundary is going to shift inland, the Eastern California shear zone, 
and Walker Lane seismic belt is a part of where the plate boundary is going to be. This is what the Western U.S. will look like. And it is very unassuming where this fault is. We're just in a nice little meadow forest area. You don't really see any uh, geologic structures when you're down here, but it's easy to see from aerial photography and from the air. But right now we're on just what looks like a little hill. So uh, yeah, pretty crazy, bruh. Interrupting real quick, just to show you guys what I'm talking about, where it's easier to spot from the air. If you look here, there is a long line following Interstate 280 with lakes in it and kind of a valley. Linear valleys and little lakes are indicative of strike slip faults. And it's easy to see in the air, but it's relatively tough to see when you're on the ground right there. So here's a diagram of some of the geomorphic features of a strike slip fault that you might see, um, such as a shutter ridge, a linear valley, a sag pond, a linear ridge, etc. And I'll be talking more about them in the field when we see them. This river, well, it's a creek, but you know, it's flowing down here along the San Andreas Fault. It's the lowest point of the valley. We're in a little rift zone. So the stream is literally flowing down the San Andreas Fault. This little hill up here with the little stations on it on the other side of the fence is called a shutter ridge. So in the year 1906, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake hit San Francisco, and it was a rupture on the San Andreas Fault. It was infamous. It killed thousands of people. There was a huge fire in San Francisco, and it's the last time the big one hit this part of Northern California. But I'm about to show you some striking evidence of that fault motion, because remember, the San Andreas Fault is strike slip, so it moves laterally. Let's see this. This is a fence um, that was here before the 1900s. That earthquake moved the fence this much. So you see all this offset? This is what, like 20 some feet of offset maybe? These fences were connected. So what does that mean? That means that right now, I am standing on the San Andreas Fault. Let's see. This fence, this was all the same fence, but look at how far it moved. That's crazy. So that's the San Andreas Fault. Here's a little more evidence of the San Andreas Fault. Look at all of this. This is not bedrock, this is all sediment. This is all rock that has been ground up by the fault. So here we go, you've got granite on this side and you've got limestone, pillow basalts and oceanic rock on the other side. So this granite moved north relatively from where it was deposited near Los Angeles to where it is today, north of San Francisco. And again, folks, almost 20 feet of strike slip offset from that one earthquake in 1906 here, magnitude 7.8. There's a huge earthquake in Turkey, same magnitude, same type of faulting. So that was stop one here on our San Andreas fault tour. Uh, we're going to go to a place where you can see shutter ridges next, which are a geomorphological structure of strike slip faulting. So uh, yeah, let's keep going. All right, so we're here at stop two of our San Andreas fault tour in the San Francisco Bay area. And uh, this is Olima Marsh. It's a trail that goes through a marsh, but you can see shutter ridges and hike along shutter ridges here on this trail, which is a geologic structure associated exclusively with strike slip faults. So shutter ridges are ridges that move along a fault line, uh, typically diverting or blocking drainage, like a stream of some sort. Um, and they're formed as the fault moves and brings earth up along it as it moves. So they're not super solid. Um, they're not made of bedrock. They're made of crushed rock and dirt that the fault crushes itself and grinds itself. So uh, let's go see some shutter ridges. They make me shudder. So if we look right here, this like this hill right here in front of us, it's not very steep right here in the foreground. That's an example of a shutter ridge. You see a little lake here. So it's kind of blocking the drainage. And if we pan back this way, there's a bigger example of a shutter ridge over there to the south. And there's a deer. There are some deer right there. Whoa. So 
so long, Bambi. It's always cool when some wildlife interrupts a geology lesson in the field. Let's go back to it. So anyways, if we look over here to the south, that's a larger example of a shutter ridge. Um, so yeah, it's just like a little hill. It looks pretty inconspicuous, but if you're in a fault zone, San Andreas fault zone in particular has world-class examples of shutter ridges. This isn't even the best one. Uh, Dragon's Back and Carrizo Plain National Monument down by LA has some pretty legit shutter ridges. But this is a small one here in Point Reyes. Still on the San Andreas Fault though. And oh my goodness. Nope, I'm not gonna tempt fate. That's, no, no, no. There's a deer across the pond. Doe, a deer, a female deer, hey. Wow, it's just so beautiful up here, guys. Well, that pretty much does it for the uh, San Andreas Fault Tour. Um, so thank you guys for watching. And be sure to stay tuned for the next video in which we talk specifically about what would happen to San Francisco and Los Angeles if the big one hit. Thanks, guys. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Solomon's Outdoor Adventures. If you enjoy content like this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel, and check out some of our other adventures right here. As always, guys, thanks again, and peace!